Hi there, my name is James Fraser. I'm a professor in the Department of Physics, Engineering, Physics, and Astronomy at Queen's University. And I'm Willem Day. I'm a course design and development specialist with the Queen's Engineering Teaching and Learning Team. And today, James is going to talk to us about perusal. With remote delivery, a lot of us are really concerned about how we engage our students in the material. We can't just give them our course notes and expect them to master it. We can't just say, go read the textbook and come back. We need to provide them with more structure, with more mentoring, you know, that idea of guide on the side to encourage them even when it, the going's tough. Perusal works really well that way. Think about it as the very first place where students will be interacting with the material. The goal is not for them to master it, but just to figure out the content, figure out what they don't even know about it. Perusal exploits social media and the sort of things that students are already very natural at doing to make the reading experience into a social experience. A lot of the intrinsic motivation is it doing it not just for themselves, but to help out their peers. And we're going to get to that. That, I think, is a huge carrot. It makes it a lot more fun, a lot more enjoyable. And even just complaining about how something isn't clear and having other students complain along with them forms a, a motivator. All right, so what's the content that you deliver through perusal? It can be either a textbook, but then students have to pay to access. I use all my own lecture notes. So I just have put them up in PDF format. And then in this dummy course that I've created just for this, you can see that, those course notes. I make assignments once or twice a week where I assign specific pages that students need to read. And then as they are reading the material, when they get stuck on something, they can annotate it. So they can just identify something that they didn't understand and start a conversation on it. So here is something like, specific comment here that someone has made, and then I, as the instructor, can see that conversation that they started with that. In a real course, what you'll end up finding is that a student maybe asks a question, some other student gives a shot trying to answer, another student pipes up with their opinion. And you see how this is, ends up being really, really valuable because it has all the richness of a learning community, but without the bandwidth requirements of full sync delivery. So it's sort of like a thread almost. Everyone that's going through and reading this document, they can all see wherever anyone has annotated in the text. That's exactly right. Now, if I had 160 students, though, which I'm going to have in the fall, I'm going to break them up into eight groups of 20. So it'll just be 20 students who are always working together, creating those threads and answering each other's questions. And I'll also comment, I don't set it up so that they're anonymous. I think it's really important that they see that little picture of each other, that they get a chance to say, hey, thanks, that was really helpful. That is part of the intrinsic motivation. Often you'll find students in, the, in these threads finding other resources on the net, cutting and pasting those links into the thread to try and answer questions. Sometimes you have students making jokes. All that I think is great because it shows that they're engaging in the material. What ends up also being really handy is that they can actually notify each other of a comment or a question by just uh, including the at symbol and then that person's name. So they can actually refer to people specifically and then the student can get emails about people talking about them or referring to them in the perusal conversation. So I think this is the other reason why I saw that people didn't just do the perusal assignment, sat down and did it in one go. They would sit down, do it, do a bunch of annotations, go away, and then, then the next day come back. So it provides more of a frictionless way for those interactions to happen, all in the spirit of trying to help encourage students to engage in the material. And engage in the material not in just one big block of time, but repeatedly, which I think is really valuable for, for their learning. Perusal has a lot of best practices. One of the best practices that they recommend is that you as the instructor stay out of those threads until the due time. If you go in, you're inserting yourself in the conversation and you know what's going to happen. All the students will just stop talking and wait until you give them the right answer. So it's important to maybe monitor the conversations, but I resist jumping in so that I provide them that space for them. Now, after the due time, that's when I go through these comments in detail. I find the ones that have been upvoted a lot. So in other words, students can respond to a thread or a question that other students have made by upvoting it. Those are obviously really very rich and important to me. I will respond to questions within the threads. And I also just say things like, hey, that's a really important point. We're going to talk about that in our synchronous session. Or that's a really good point. We're going to have an activity this week to help you master that because it is really tricky and it's really important. Also, I'll make a comment that it's very helpful for me in trying to figure out how to improve my lecture note because it becomes very clear what parts are confusing or tough to understand because you see a whole bunch of annotations. So perusal provides a lot of, of excellent sort of analytics. Whether you want to understand how individual students are doing, you can find out, you know, for instance, how much time they actually spend looking at the assignments 
all the things that they're doing with the assignments. Perusal actually separates just having the window open from active reading time. Bit of a grain of salt with these things, but nonetheless, this active reading time does give a, a rough idea of how much time they're actually scrolling through, annotating. And also in terms of the analytics, in terms of understanding what, <laughs> what time of day students we're actually working on the material. And of course, you end up seeing that approaching the deadline time, the heat map of when people are submitting things and doing annotations increases. But I also find this quite useful in terms of for every page of my PDF document, it gives me a sense of how many times students looked at it and on average, how long they spent looking at it. So here you'll start seeing cases where there's a page. Students will return to that page multiple times if they had trouble with it, which is, of course, it's good. They should be doing that. It's also valuable to me as an instructor to understand where those sticking points are. So now that, that ends up being a pretty useful analytic as well. There's a, what's called a confusion report. I haven't found that that useful. What I found much more useful would be things like upvoted questions, because that to me indicates a question that a student has asked and asked well, and a lot of other students have the same question. So I want to make sure I cover that. And then I develop the activities for the week based on that. So this is also part of the intrinsic motivation. Students applying themselves well to perusal, me saying, hey, you told me you had this problem. This activity is to try and deal with that problem that's only gonna encourage them to make use of the perusal assignment the next week in even a more engaged fashion. So always trying to build those sort of positive cycles within the course so that students keep working at the material. One final thing is another little bit of a motivator is I do mark students on their annotations. Perusal has its own AI algorithm to do this based on the sophistication of the questions or the annotation. Things like they have to make some annotations all the way through. They can't just do them all at once based on number of times they get upvoted. And what I say to students is I'm not looking for, I'm certainly not looking for mastery, but I want more than participation. Participation isn't good enough. So I'm looking for best effort. And what I've determined is if Perusal gives something a two out of three, for me, that's met my bar for best effort. So that's how I make use of the Perusal's grading system to provide students with that extra little bit of incentive to make that best effort in the, in the material. Could you elaborate a little bit? How exactly does the grading system work? It has, they have some pretty interesting different ways that you can actually do it. They have a one recommended technique, which makes use of a whole bunch of input parameters and determines a grade based on those. It also does in terms of the grading rubric, and it doesn't let students put all their annotations on the first page of, let's say, that 15-page that reading assignment. It's looking for those annotations to be spread out. It also provides an opportunity that even after the deadline, students can go back in at perusal and answer other people's questions, and they get a bit of a bump up in their grade. If they didn't have that much time beforehand, they get some advantage to going back in and adding to the conversation afterwards. So it ends up being quite holistic. And I end up just following the, the recommended rubric using the weights that Perusal sets as the default. And that seems to work quite well. Okay. Again, that was Professor James Fraser from the Department of Physics, Engineering Physics, and Astronomy at Queen's University. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the ETLT by email or book an appointment with us to discuss your course today.